Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we live in a world that is filled with conflict. We look inside ourselves and we see struggles there also. We simply want rest. We want to experience something that satisfies, something that gives us calm and peace and security. Give that to us today. Through your, your dear son, Jesus, we ask in his name. Amen. Well, as I just said, I think it is an apt description of the human condition that people are looking for rest. They're looking for something that has substance to us, that gives their life a sense of calm, a feeling of peace, uh, to know that life is not just helter-skelter and a bunch of conflicting nations, individuals, whatever. And whether you're in the church or you're not in the church, whether you're a Christian or not a Christian, whether you're religious or not religious, we're we're always look we're all looking for something. We're trying to find something that will give us that sense of rest. So I want to look real quickly at the readings and give you something of an enigma, a problem, a difficulty that appears in our text. And then to see if we can resolve it. The Lord gave the people of Israel rest in the land, basically rest from conflict, rest in an external sense. And perhaps that's just a superficial sense because then we go to Psalm 95 and it says, uh, they didn't have rest. God looked at those people and he said, Today, if you hear my voice, don't harden your heart like those ingrates back in the wilderness who were always quarreling with me, who were always testing me, who disobeyed me. Don't be like them. And of course, the hint, pretty strong, is if you want rest, do this. Obey me. Don't let your hearts go astray. Don't get off of my way. Then you come to the book of Hebrews. And he says, you know, when God says today, don't harden your hearts as those did in the rebellion, he's talking about the fact that there's a rest available. That there's another day when God will offer his rest. And he repeats the warning against disobedience. And, and don't be a bunch of complainers and whiners like they were. Always distrusting God. But now it gets interesting. He says with the word today, he indicates there's another day. And there's a rest that's available. And that there is a rest for the people of God. And those entering into God's rest also rest from their works. Okay, back up the tape. This is, something's wrong here. On one hand, he says the way to rest is not to be disobedient, implying being obedient. On the other hand, he says the way to rest is to rest from your works, just as God did from his. Well, as Desi said to Lucy, you got some splaining to do, Mr. Preacher. How can both of those be the avenue and the road to rest?
I have to jump ahead and then I'm going to go back and explain it. But Jesus says, if you want real rest, listen to my words and believe the one who sent me, the one who has a plan, the one who we hear those famous words, God so loved the world, he sent his son. And when you believe in him, and you know that God knows what he's doing, you will have eternal life right now. You will not come into judgment, either now or in the future. You have passed from death to life. Now, the Greek perfect tense is really important. It's usually translated has or have in our English Bibles. But it has a double sense, and it's really hard to communicate. It's something that happened in the past that has an ongoing effect. So when he says, you have eternal life, right now you have it, and that's going to be an ongoing reality. So what are we going to do here? On the one hand, the way to rest is obedience. On the other hand, the way to rest is to rest from your works. This is one of the enigmas, one of the problems that Scripture often presents. How can you both obey and be free from obeying? Well, there's a passage and an old spiritual I'd like to share with you. In Isaiah 53, and if you're looking at it, it's about verse 7. It says, he, Jesus, was opposed and afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb slept to slaughter, like a sheep before its shears, he is silent. He opened not his mouth. That's so different from us. You know, when, when the, the psalm says, be careful, don't harden your hearts, our natural instinct, our natural position is hard hearts. We're self-centered folks. We are always looking out for number one. And we, with those Jews in the wilderness, always have a grumbly in our tumbly. We always think we know better than God how our life should go. We always think that if only God would put us in charge, we could straighten this world out. And what in the heck is he doing? He can't seem to get the world going in the right direction. He can't seem to orchestrate our lives in the way that we would like. And so we sit here and we complain and we gripe and we moan and we groan. But Jesus was silent. We think God is not handling things right. Jesus is the only person on this planet who ever experienced unjust suffering. And yet, he said nothing. He didn't say, come on, Dad. Do you see what Dan is doing? You mean I got to die for him? I've got to take his judgment so he can be free of judgment? I've got to suffer silently? Are you kidding me? And yet he did it. He did it so that I'm not condemned, I'm not judged, I'm not 
labeled a failure because Jesus took my place and was completely obedient. Now I receive the rest that only he can give. You know that passage so well, 2 Corinthians 5.21. God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Do you get it? He was judged. We're not. He died to defeat death. We have eternal life that is so potent, so powerful, that it's like we have passed from the darkness of death to the brilliant light of life. You know, Christians, typically, myself included, have a problem. We read passages like those verses in Hebrews chapter 4 that they, they missed out on the rest because they were disobedient, and we say, oh, got to try harder. I'm not living up to what I should be. And we feel guilty, and we're buried, and submerged in our guilt. And then we go to a place like Ephesians 2, and I'm going to paraphrase it. Uh, for our rest, it's by grace, not of works, the things we do out here, not of yourself, the things we do in here. It's a gift of God. And we're giddy. Grace overwhelms us. We can have a smile on our face. We feel good about ourselves. God loves us. Everything's great. And whips all back and forth. Then we do something we know that hurts people or doesn't meet their expectations or we hurt ourselves with some stupid thing. And then we're right back over here. Oh, I got to try harder. I really got to put my shoulder to the wheel. I really have to get serious about being a Christian. And then we come to church and we hear a sermon or we come to Holy Communion and we say, ah, God loves me. It's unconditional. It's unexpected. It's undeserved. It's unqualified. Have you ever noticed that in your life, this whipsaw back and forth from guilt to giddiness? It happens to all of us because we forget about Jesus. We forget he's the one who took our place under the law to redeem us, to rescue us, to save us. I'd like to conclude with a story And you're not going to recognize this name. One of my best friends in Forest Grove, this is his favorite preacher. Whenever he can find a sermon on YouTube by Steve Brown, he heads for it. Steve Brown is a radio preacher who has one of the most beautiful, resonant voices you'll ever hear. So this is a Steve Brown story. Steve Brown's daughter, Robin was taking a course in the English literature department at the university. And she went to her dad and she says, Dad, this is too hard. I can't do it. So being a good dad, he went to the head of the English literature department and he says, Robin needs to get out of this class. She can't do it. She can't handle it. It's too hard. The English literature department head looked at Robin and he said, Robin, here's what I'm going to do. Even before you turn in an assignment, even before you take another class, I'm going to give you an A. Nothing you can do 
Nothing you do will lessen that grade. Nothing you do will increase that grade. I guarantee you an A. Do you think you would take the course if I guarantee that you've got an A? Well, Robin's no dummy. Yeah, I can do that. With the pressure off, with no need to prove herself, guess what? On her own steam, she got all A's. She was not under the gun. Now think about that. Jesus on the cross says, it is finished. You've all gotten an A. Doesn't matter what you do today or tomorrow. It can't take away from your A. It can't add to your A. You've got an A. He has accomplished everything. You're no longer judged a failure. You're no longer condemned. You are guaranteed that at the end of your life you will not be judged because Christ was judged in your place. You are guaranteed right now, this very moment, that you have eternal life. You will not come into judgment. You have passed from death to life. And guess what? You will probably outperform even your expectations. Being about the business of telling other people who are restless, who are perplexed, who are confused, where they can find real, deep, solid, secure soul rest. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, when we are filled with guilt, doubt, uncertainty, turn the eyes of our heart to Jesus and to his cross. Help us to realize, to experience, to take to heart that his life, his death, his resurrection gives us an A today and for all eternity. We ask in Jesus' name, amen.